secondary. Okay, on behalf of the municipality of Argyle, we offer our deepest condolences to the to those affected. Okay, I'll start over. CT me is arrived. You're blocking the view, Gary. Okay, I have a statement from the uh, Municipality of Argyle on behalf of the councillors and staff. We offer our deepest condolences to those affected by the fire in Pumnico Head. It is an incident so tragic, it is almost unspeakable. Our community, our province, and our nation is deeply saddened by this dark event. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the family members recovering from this tragedy and to family and friends who are doing all they can in what seems like an impossible situation. Pumnico is a small community. Argyle is a small municipality. But, is it, but it is in these darkest times that we see the community stand tall by giving their spirit and their passion to rebuild what they love and to help their neighbors. The municipality is playing a small part in all of this by having open trust accounts at the Credit Union, the Royal Bank of Canada. For those who wish to help financially and collect information from residents who seek to give their time, effort and materials. We ask our community to once again raise to the occasion and support these families in their time of greatest need. Thank you. Here, here. <clears throat> At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. Okay, I have a paper copy here. Do we have an approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Negative, nay. Motion carried. Is there any conflicts of interest to be declared? Seeing none, we'll move on to number four, presentations. And I believe we have a presentation from Verna Worth. That's it. I have to start off in such a somber uh, uh, moment. Um, so I'll just introduce myself first. I'm Verna Worth, better known as the spouse of Ken Pache. I'm a resident of Little Ridgeport. Lucy is my counselor. And I had the pleasure of being on the Herc on dumping day to overfly his uh, boat. Um, no way. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. I know. No, you are. I even spoke to you guys. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> was, was it over uh, the line? <laughs> no. Uh, we actually... Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, yeah. no. uh, you um, may remain silent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You didn't know that, but uh, I told yeah. your dad, actually. Um, right? So just to start on the uh, automatic, automatic, automated external defibrillator. I'm not an expert, medical expert. I just want to state that up front. I've never had to use one. I've been trained to use one and hopefully never have to use one. But um, the other thing I should uh, cite is all of my information either came through research on the web, uh, but I didn't attribute it. So I can't take credit for all of the, uh, all the information. Um, I'm assuming you've all ran through the presentation. Does anybody know, not know what an AED is? And the reason I ask that, because some people in the community that I talked to actually didn't know what it was. So if you don't know, that's fine. If I'm, I hope you don't insult your intelligence, but I think this is to the benefit, perhaps, this is broadcast to those folks that, mm -hmm. um, that might not know about it. So, here we use this fancy thing. So my purpose, um, and it comes out of sort of just reflecting on the things that have happened. Um, or, or potentially could happen. For example, we have the Big Tuna Fest in Witchport, and that's a huge gathering of individuals. And uh, it doesn't matter what age these people are, anybody could suffer an incident. And we are quite a ways away from any emergency assistance um, being in a rural area. 
and quite spread out. So that made me reflect that maybe the museum, and because we're doing monthly events now, we need to have um, an AED. And so that's how we ended up having one. And you'll see more on that later. So my purpose is to convince you as a counselors um, of the need or the importance of having a program in the council. And you'll see more when I show, and you'll see in the slides about how some communities actually really embrace this concept. And I think we need to do that here even though I don't think the province has something. And maybe we can lead from the bottom up on that. And then also, these aren't cheap devices. Um, and as I'll say again, no life has got a price on it. And um, funding shouldn't be an issue, and maybe there's a way to work around that. So it shouldn't limit us. OK, so as an AD, just to run through the, the basics of it, which you probably, like I say, already know, automated extrapolator. That's where the AED acronym comes from. They're lightweight portable. As you can see here, it's very lightweight. Um, it delivers an electric, electric shock to the chest. And obviously you have to remove clothing to do that. It can potentially stop an irregular heartbeat, also known as arrhythmia by medical people, and allow a normal rhythm to resume sudden cardiac <coughs> arrest. There's the, the beast there. So a sudden cardiac arrest occurs when the heart valve functions and stops beating unexpectedly. And that happens, you see young kids in hockey arenas, it happens too, they suddenly collapse. And if an AED is on hand, we know that young people that have survived that, and even older people. Um, if it's not treated within minutes, we know at least to death. If you don't have your heart pumping, organs die. Um, so the heart must be defibrillated quickly. A victim's chance to surviving drops 7 to 10% for every minute a normal heartbeat isn't restored. So why are they important? Well, it's possible for more people to respond to a medical emergency where defibrillation is required. You don't have to be a medical doctor. And because they're portable, they can be used by medical, non-medical people. So a snapshot of AEDs in Canada. If you look at other provinces, and not to be critical of Nova Scotia, um, because different incidents in different provinces have prompted this. I know where I live in Ontario, it was a young fellow that was the driver behind getting AEDs into Ontario. They have an extensive program. They actually have a bill. Um, so the bill is an app to provide for defibrillators in premises accessed by members of the public. And they even have them outdoors in recreational areas. That's how widespread their program is. And uh, you'll note that uh, City of Toronto has their city hall even. So I think that says a lot about uh, how they've really embraced that. Um, you see BC, City of Vancouver has a bunch, City of Kawartha Lakes, City of Hamilton. Um, you can read that through all yourself, but basically, Every one of these cities and areas has recognized the importance of it and made it part of their, um, their program. So here in Nova Scotia, and this happened, uh, there was another incident that happened earlier, and that's where, unfortunately, was fatality. This one was actually a happy incident, but, so this happened December 21st, well, maybe it didn't happen December 21st. The article appeared December, December 21st. This young guy here, the guy in the middle, um, almost died. If he fortunately survived, but there was no nobody knew where a defibrillator was, and that's a problem in Nova Scotia. That same article shows the amount of um, defibrillators that exist. CBC obtained this through access to information, and they located all of them, put them on the map, and uh, they do note that it may not be up to date. Um, but in fact, um, you know, if you look here, it's got a big spot in our part of the world. And Barrington, just to show the type of information that they do display, if you register your AED, because the problem is these, a lot aren't registered. YMCA has one, um, Atlantic Superstore has one. Those are the ones I've seen and known of. There's gotta be more, Marina and yet they're not registered. Sorry? Marina, Marina, Marina Center has one. Right, and it's not, on, it's oh. not registered, right? So through registration, you do one of two things. You say where it is, and you can also note uh, if you are an AED responder. And that means that individual uh, within 1,200 meters, 1.2 kilometers, can be asked to go respond. But you don't have to have any responders if you know, people are uncomfortable with that. So when you look at that big gap here, um, and it's a shame because we're not registered yet, and I'm in the process of doing that for us at the museum, but it could save a life. And yet, that thing could be right there and nobody knows about it. So just to look at the Muspial Argyle, which we talked about a little bit, 
we don't have a program. If we do, it's not visible on the website. I, I don't believe there is a program. I didn't, you know, call up any of the counselors or uh, um, any of the staff, but it doesn't appear there's one. Um, <coughs> the fire falls certainly have emergency vehicles. Sorry, the fire falls certainly have them in their vehicles, but it's not accessible to the public. So if you were in Wedgeport, for example, at the fire hall at an event, somebody collapses, good luck. All fire halls? All fire halls have them? Fire trucks. All, all fire trucks? No. no. No? We don't have any in Arlington history. No. Oh, then I made an assumption that's wrong then. Um, certainly the they do have any. Yeah, because I've talked to the firemen, so I'm, I extrapolated that <laughs> assumption. Um, they certainly do in Wedgeport. And uh, yeah, that's. Uh, but but you're doing great, and I'm going to back you up here in a couple of minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to tell any lies, but I yeah, just made no, an assumption no. there because to me it'd be shocking that they didn't. Quite honestly, and now I'm anyway not trying to out any of the fire departments because um, I know funding's an issue. So we purchased ours in July. Um, I, I had full support from the museum. I'm on the board for the museum as well, and uh, so you'll see that not only did we install one, which I brought today to show you. Um, we also did some other stuff that's not quite related to this, but we looked at EpiPens and uh, for um, also for uh, coma, um, diabetics, we have a, a needle for that, and then some aspirins in case somebody had a stroke, because again, you can't hurt somebody if you give them an aspirin and they don't need it. So uh, we have the sign posted. Um, the fishermen in the area, because a lot of people access our museum. It's the go-to place like Pubnico has. It's a go-to place. There's people there from early in the morning till uh, you know 10 o'clock and and all the guys there have know about it like if they're working at the wharf they know about it and they have keys so it's, it's pretty accessible in that way but if the building is locked they don't have access to it unfortunately so my bottom line which kind of already summarized is basically they're easy and safe for anyone to use um, you know you don't have to you know you, you can this cannot this only go so far but I'll actually tell you what to do Call 911 for example. Follow help, help. instructions to apply pads. Remove clothing from patient's chest. Locate pads package in back of AED. Tear open pads package. Peel adhesive pads from blue liner. Apply pads to patients their chest has shown. So we'll go so far and then once they're connected, it will say analyze and then we'll tell you. Remove clothing from patient's chest. <laughs> Locate pads package. Very persistent. Powering off. There we go. So it's really simple, um, like I said. And um, so anyway, like I said, it'll analyze and it'll decide if you have to go shock. So you don't have to go, do I do, do, I do it or don't I do it? Um, they're safe to use, and they always tell you to step back. Most people know that. We don't want to get shocked. I don't think it'd kill you, but it wouldn't be pleasant. Um, and they say it's impossible to make a medical decision worse. So if you administer it and it wasn't necessary, it's not going to make it worse. That's what I found out on the websites. Um, and they save lives. I mean, we're talking only $2,000. Well, $2,000 is a lot of money, but no life has a price on it. <coughs> So my recommendation is that council consider adopting a program. So that program would um, encourage local businesses and community centers to install and register and register the AEDs. I think that's kind of critical. And that uh, Ms. Pelley, in the interest of dealing with, you know, it's a large sum of money, but it's not large when compared to a life, as they consider how you're going to fund for this building, for example, there should be one right off the bat, or over at um, where the archives are, or both places, I don't know. Um, that's a decision, I think, as part of that public access program. It's got to assess strategically where do you put these and then look at how you're going to fund them, whether it's interest free loans or do you have a portion of the costs, you know, as an incentive to buy. That's something that I think I'm not going to I'm <coughs> tell you how to do your business. And I, and I know budgets are always are very, very tight, but um, this is something I just wanted to put forth to you folks. And, uh, and like I said, municipal office, legions, and other community centers. Um, and schools. I mean, schools are used for recreation. A lot of times these incidents occur during sporting events. You know, they don't occur usually when somebody's sitting at a desk, although they could. Anyway, that was it. And if you have any questions, far away. Uh, Deputy Warden Hughes. In, in the uh, recommendation for program, how many would you save 
we would have to install and you know like I said like you said like in, in community centers and schools and whatever uh, is I there think, a number that I think you have to look at strategic locations and areas that are going to be open a lot um, I mean I, I'm just thinking of wage part and I'm, and again it, it'll take a sort of bit of mapping and consider you know, where a lot of people might congregate or um, central. So, for example, Shop of Carl, it's open quite early morning, late at night. That might be where you, you know you go to Shop of Carl and say, "Hey, um, why don't you guys put one in there?" Yeah, because um, I'm on the uh, uh, library board, and there was a recommendation from our board, from the library, that that if each municipality at least put <coughs> one in each library that they have in their municipalities. You know, that, that, that yeah. would be good. I think so that's that, I think that's the thing that's got to be cracked is kind of looking at this, figuring out budgets are. I mean, if you, if you could, uh, if all the money in the world, you put one everywhere, but you can't. So you know, I think your big uh, one is to try and leverage off businesses. Um, I think I already mentioned it. In some areas, they actually have it public accessible all the time by having outside. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if that's an option, let's say for uh, the credit union in Wedgeport and I guess here, you know, you go into the ATM, it's heated, it's got some security there, boom, that's accessible, um, you know, 24 seven actually. Yes. Um, um, and places where people, large numbers congregate. Like I said, that's something that's gonna take some thinking and, you know, the strategy of that, you know, balancing funds against what makes sense and what businesses are willing to, you know, fork out, would the credit unions be willing to fork out and uh, put one in, in their uh, locations. Mr. Glenn, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. I uh, would have loved to have you here a couple of week, months ago, I guess. Um, very, very good uh, or, uh, report that you gave us there on AEDs. I'm a retired paramedic of 33 years. I've personally used AEDs. I personally know of three people walking around Today because of AEDs um, and don't mean to hijack what you're saying here by no means uh, but the muse and I know you can't do anything about it here but I just want you to, to hear being as though you're pushing these AEDs so good and that and they are a great thing and that we have two men walking around today in Lower West Pubnico uh. and that because of them and this was in the field in Lower West Pubnico and one in Argyle Sound because of them. That's the ones that I know for sure uh, that have been brought back because AEDs. We've got one, we had one ambulance in the municipality of Argyle that was a priority based ambulance, which meant that it stayed uh, or there was an ambulance in that base in Pubnico unless it was out on calls. When, out, when it was out on calls, another one would float into the area. It's very well centrally located between the Pubnicos and the Argyles. Uh, for some reason, back eight months ago, we lost that status. And uh, I'm fighting to get that status back. And uh, for, for every seven to 10 percent, for every minute, a normal heartbeat isn't restored. So, uh, We've had a couple of bad calls down there in the last couple of weeks as far as medical calls. I know you cannot come from Yarmouth or come from Barrington up no. if there's nobody there with an AED. We've got great MFR program down home, but again, a lot of those MFR responders are fishermen or tied into the fishing industry. And um, yeah. I tell you, I'm gonna fight more yet to get it back, as sure. simple as that. But, and I agree with you 100%, as many AEDs we can go to get out in the communities, we have to get them. And, uh, they're a great thing. Yeah. Very Thank nice. You for that. Councillor Albright. I just was wondering if, let's say a business decides that they want to get an AED, is there some kind of training that comes along with that? Because like I know myself, I don't think I would be comfortable using that device, but I'm there, wondering. There is, and I know that um, we didn't actually get the training 
except via video. But the video is very disruptive. In fact, that article, if you if you go to that CBC article, mm -hmm. they actually show a demo of one. Okay. So you really don't need more training than just the explanation, so you know what's coming, perhaps. Um, but they do do training. I know um, Ellen Cutro, she works as a lifeguard, YMC, they have exactly that model, which is why I didn't have particular you know, interest in any different model. I just thought, well, if they've got it, it must be, they've got some local people know how to use it and can say something about it. Um, they do training, but that's probably just refresher training. And if you take any, any uh, first aid course, which involves CPR, they include that now. Um, the, the only thing you don't do is uh, actually deliver the shock. Same CPR, you don't actually put all the pressure. Right. So the training is pretty basic, actually. And that's why you don't even have to be trained. That thing tells you what to do. You know, rip off the shirt, you know. It's basically, and then, you know, stick the pads on, and they, it shows you on there. And I'll tell you again until you do it right. Like, I don't know if you saw this, but it's basically shoulder and, and then a little hard, I guess. Blow the heart and not the shoulder. It's really basic. Um, and they have them for children. I'm still trying to get them to respond to me because I worried something for children because they're a little bit different, uh, smaller, smaller shock. Um, but, you know, you don't have to be trained. That's the whole point of them. You have, you know, it's pretty scary to get some CPR and not know how much you've got for SMS or something. This thing is dead simple. It's easier than I think of. I would mean, hate to have to give somebody CPR. I'd never have to. I would hate to have to do it because you never know how much you do not, you know, such a the breast and all that sort of stuff. This is like, it'll tell you what to do. So, but training can be made though. Absolutely. Absolutely can be made. And like I said, the white is Councillor Uh do you know of any maintenance to those units? So if you, they were purchased, like is it, is there a regular yeah. maintenance that's battery? A, or something? Yeah, that's part of the uh, registration program. So the registration program will actually, um, and I'm in the process, like I said, of registering, it'll actually the model and the battery, the battery life. This company also tracks it. So they actually um, will remind us in five years. So the battery's good for five years. So they track it. And they'll say, oh, you guys are coming back for five years. Replace your battery. And that's the whole point of registration, too. They will remind you that you are new. First of all, thanks for coming to your presentation. Uh, great presentation. And I personally think this is a, it's a real great idea. I don't know what a program that Ms. Valley would, would put on looks like or... I mean, I have been beginning to think about it, but it definitely is something we should probably look into. Um, a point to make is anyone who, who is a fisherman, uh, especially a captain, anyone who's captain's papers, has to do uh, marine advanced first aid training. And any marine advanced first aid training comes with training on how to use these AEDs. And quite frankly, uh, no offense to the people that do the training, but if you watch the video or if you've been on YouTube, it's pretty yeah. well, you're like, they're like, for lack of better terms, idiot proof. They're made to be used in, in a real simple situation and high stress and freaking out. If you can listen to what the person's saying in these AEDs, you can use them. So I personally have always felt that although we get trained for them to use in our vessels, there should be some incentive to put these things in our vessels, right? Because it, it's like you say, I think it was, when I priced them through the St. John Ambulance, it was like $1,200 plus uh, you need to, if you if you choose to, you gotta buy the case yeah. and put on the wall. Uh, which is a few hundred bucks more but if there was some program to entice fishermen to put these things on their boats you know a lot of lives have been lost <coughs> at, at sea due to cardiac arrest right and it's a long time before that helicopter can get there and, and whatnot so it's uh it, just for the fishing industry that i'm thinking of it'd be it'd be an awesome example. actually one of the fishermen on the board actually started thinking about that yeah for sure you know, he's, yeah. so yeah it, i think it triggered something to think about because they're not super expensive I mean they're not cheap but not in, not in the eye of, of you know someone's life it's, exactly it's, yeah. it's totally doable huh? I mean you've got a lot of safety equipment on board already EPIRPS and all that yeah, sort of stuff sure. so. um, if the municipality if other councillors were willing to look at some kind of program uh, you know with our future years budget or, or you know, some kind of organizational program I'd be really interested in that I mean I don't know if you approach one of the companies and see if you can get uh, you know we bought let's say 10 over Mm -hmm. deal, yeah, because I was thinking about that as well. Another point, you know, and I, and I mentioned it to this kind of the salesman I dealt with because this comes out of BC actually, and he said, "Yeah, we can look at that, but you know, until you come forth with some concrete mm -hmm. stuff, he's not going to entertain that." Answer right again. Uh, I uh, certainly would like to, uh, uh, like uh, Councillor LeBlanc said, 
have, have a, a look at what we could do. Uh, first of all, I think what we should be doing is uh, ask the CAO to get maybe our EMO coordinator and or EMC uh, say how many units are there in the municipality. And like you were saying, maybe there's a bunch out there that's not registered. So if we could make a list of what's out there, then we could be determined from there. Yeah, that's, that's something I'd like to add on. For example, last spring when I took the first aid kit, the uh, first aid course, we learned how to use them plus do the CPR. And, and I worked for Camo Seafoods for uh, part time during the summer. And last summer, they have, I forget the exact number that they bought, but they put them in all their boats, they put them in all their plants. Uh, they, it seems to me like 15 is a number that's going on the top of my head, but they did buy a lot. But again, they're, they're places that are closed up most of the time, like when the plant's running, it's fine, there's people there. But So there's a lot, you know, probably a lot out there. I'm sure there, well, I know for sure there's one in, in um, Sea Life Fisheries in East Pumnico, and there would be one at Skipper Fisheries and at the Weldon Shop in West Pumnico, the two facilities they have here. But uh, yeah, so there are ones out there that just, and not that aren't registered, so I'll be bringing that. Well, you look bringing, at that map. Mm, yeah, I'll be bringing that up like to my employer. So, and thank you for coming, and I'm sure we'll be looking at, Kathy has something to say? <laughs> just Kathy, one. <laughs> look, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, thank you for coming in. I know my husband's in the East Pumnico Fire Department, and he uh, talks about these uh, AEDs all the time. And we do have one at the East Pumnico. It comes from the EHN, EHN. Mm -hmm. so it must be registered. Yeah. No, not, not really. really. Not according to this map. So anyway, we'll have to get that registered. Yeah. There's also one out in Elmwood. Councillor Diantimo. Thank you again for your, your presentation. I'm just thinking about uh, uh, the one that's at the Mariner Center and there's also one at the, uh, the Rink and Barrington. And the, the, the one at the Rink and Barrington, uh, it was uh, funded through um, Kevin Murphy. Kevin Murphy is the Speaker of the House uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, he was a young hockey player who sustained a, a, an injury that uh, put him in a wheelchair, but he uh, persevered and, and, you know, with his life, and uh, I know he used to own the, the hockey team in Muscadel, and that's where he's from. And he bought a defibrillator for, for there. I think, am I, is that the right, uh, yeah. Defibrillator, yeah. The AED, sorry. Oh, it's the same thing. Same thing. And, and then uh, they had some kind of a, he made some kind of a, I don't know how exactly he went about it, but he might be a good person to talk to because he actually funded somehow uh, a lot of these uh, AEDs for, for periods. So Kevin Murphy might be a good person to... Uh, <coughs> the other thing is to, you know, bump it up to the next level, to yeah, the MLA yeah. level, find yeah, out he, what he, sort of... He is the Speaker percent. of the House, so he probably should have a few uh, you know, provincial connections. So. Yeah, it's not going to be another person. Exactly. Any, any more questions or comments? How much of these you want to talk about? <laughs> Oh, the honor? Yeah, just um, just the just the pads. Oh, just the pads. Because uh, every time they're used, I'm sure they have to be. They, oh, they're, for sure. They're, they're and there's a spare pad. Thirty, thirty, forty dollars. Thirty, forty dollars. Yeah. So it gives an idea. And how many do you have on hand? And how many do you have on hand? We've got two, and I want to get one for the children. There's a children's okay. size one, which I haven't yet been able to. So, so you're looking yeah. at two thousand and another maybe hundred, hundred fifty dollars for the for the pads. Well, that was included. In that was two thousand. It oh. was included, but when you got to go replace them or the battery, okay. I don't know. There. But it's only every five years at least for that. <coughs> Any more questions or comments? See none. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Great presentation. Thank That's you. Great. Okay, we'll move. We'll move on to number five, adoption of, of the minutes, and we all we have the regular council meetings from December twelfth. We have a motion to adopt those minutes. Motion to adopt the minutes. Second. 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 Second.
Slow move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Negative. Motion carried. Business arising from the minutes. I just had a couple of. Take right over. Okay. CEO. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of items. <laughs> You can call me whatever you want. <laughs> You're the chair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the just a couple of things. We, there were some conversations in the last meeting that we wanted to make sure that uh, council and those watching had the information. One was uh, regarding the airport. So I will have a more comprehensive piece on the staff report. But there was the the question of of how much uh, the airport operations uh, cost the municipality and the in the current fiscal year or, or, or generally. And uh, the total cost of, of that service last year was $201,840. So that is 232 that we pay as an operating subsidy. And then we receive approximately uh, 31 or 30,000 as a, uh, a, a reimbursement for the portion of property tax that's collected by the municipality of Yarmouth, but then distributed um, to the funders in the same percentage that they fund the airport. So we do pay 232, but then we get a rebate or refund of 30,000. Um, that is, uh, it, it's the total budget would then therefore be 800,000 uh, between the three municipal units minus the uh, property taxes, which is approximately a total of 105. So um, those numbers are definitely going to change over time. Uh, and I can get into that, into the staff meeting, where it gets into the detail of where we're headed, not so much where we were, but where we're going. Uh, so that's the, that's the figure that was budgeted last year, and it will, it will be that number. Um, uh, it won't be, there won't be any overage. And any, any sort of overage that the budget may have at the airport uh, this year the accumulated surplus of prior years would have will will absorb that. So this year was a particularly heavy year because we did approximately one hundred and thirty thousand dollars of runway. So that doesn't happen every year. So so that that number does go uh, in the past has had a tendency to go up and down, but quite recently has been maintained at that number. Um, and then in the staff report, I can talk about the services that are being provided there now to give some context um, around that number because that number is, is, is hard to, it's hard to be meaningful just standing on its own. Um, you know, when you compare that particular cost of service to other costs of service, um, for instance, you know, waste, uh, uh, waste uh, pickup, for instance, is about $360,000 for Argyle. Waste diversion costs about the same. So it gives you context of the services that we're providing that, you know, for instance, the total uh, between the two is between both waste pickup and diversion is about 660,000 to 680,000, depending on the volume. And so it gives you some context of the, the, the weight or the percentage of the investment. It's not a small investment. Um, and um, in the staff report, I'll talk further about how those adjustments are being made moving forward. Uh, and as you know, we're in year three of four of the funding agreement. And so you are contractually obligated uh, this year and one more year for funding with your two other partners. Um, and after that, it, it becomes renegotiated based on the party's wishes. Uh, the second question or or, or item that was discussed was the cost of demolition of the Dominion Textiles mm -hmm. building that was raised by Councillor Surrett. Um, you are quite right to raise the issue of tipping fees being more expensive than budgeted. Uh, definitely not an unanticipated expense, but uh, I think when we initially planned the project, we thought we would, we would have less uh, tipping fees than, than what we actually did. One of the reasons is that more of the material actually was required to leave the facility as opposed to being buried on site. Now there are there's a there's there's a good news story behind that because you're limited in terms of how you can use the property if you if you left uh, things like brick etc on site. You're restricted what you can build there in the future, and therefore it restricts the, the potential resale value of the property. However, um, the the cost of of tipping fees we have to remind ourselves that that we are in fact paying ourselves. 
Um, so we are operating the tipping fee operation. And so there will be some conversations between the three CAOs around what exactly gets billed, how does it get managed, and how does it get paid. So where we are right now is, is we'll probably be asking the uh, waste uh, park to bill that amount, but, and then the municipalities will participate financially in that bill. But then, but then there'll be an opportunity for us to look at the at the uh, waste park or waste authorities operations and take a look at at the because it will it will generate a significant profit in inside the company that we own. So uh, we we have been planning for a long time to replace the C and D landfill, and we've been saving for that um, for that uh, event. Uh, what this did was it sped up that process. And so um, there are incremental or additional costs that occurred because of the demolition, but the other part of the cost was a capital cost we knew was coming. And so we've anticipated that cost and it's, it's already been uh, budgeted for inside the operation. So we haven't finalized any sort of decision around that. All to say is that um, you know, our portion of that would be 200 and, or I guess 300 and, 300 and something thousand dollars. Um, um, I'm, I will, I'm sure, when we come back and have a decision uh, around that number, that's not going to be the net amount that we pay. It will be, it will be the net amount will be significantly less than that amount. So um, we'll keep you posted. And I know, Councillor, that is that is an organization you chair, and so the three CAOs really have to finish their work around that, and want to make sure everybody was aware of what was going on. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Is that it for business horizon from the minutes? I think so, yeah. Okay. Move along to um, number seven, the warden's report. And it was very slow over the Christmas holidays. Um, the Curling Association meeting, and I hear I heard on the radio today they'll be opening up later this week. And we had an airport meeting, which I'll end just brief this on. Uh, next, councillor's reports. Starting this end, and Councillor Surratt? All set for this time, the holidays, I guess, to everything. Yeah. <coughs> I just want to say that I attended the uh, uh, sledge hockey uh, event on Saturday. I sat on the sledge. <laughs> I, <went. laughs> I didn't fall over. Okay, very good. So, no, it was a great event, though, and I think it's a great thing that they can bring that, they incorporate that in the, uh, in the programs here. In your arm, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for attending on my behalf. Because I would have fell over. You <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Like we said, it was slow over the holidays, but uh, yeah, I did attend a, yeah, an airport meeting. But uh, our CEO just updated us quite a bit. Again, we're we're trying to bring the airport down to a more manageable level for our for our budget, but still retaining. Uh, especially safety services to, to our area and things like that. Um, there was another one. This is why I should write things down. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just popped into me before I said something. I'll think of it later. Go ahead, guys. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, um, just one little thing uh, about our community hall. Uh, just after our Christmas party from the municipality, uh, a stove, uh, a pipe busted from our furnace and uh, the hall was is full of soot, so it's a long process of cleaning our hall. So we always go one step ahead and five back. So anybody that wants to rent the hall will have to wait a bit. Mr. <laughs> Bigman? Uh, only thing I'd like to say is I, uh, when the storm, windstorm was coming here last week, I uh, made a small Facebook uh, statement saying if I could ask if I could help anyone uh, in the area to please call. Um, I'm overwhelmed at the way it took off. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone that called. If you look under uh, my Facebook page, people just started calling in, uh, calling me up, and that listen, Glenn, I have a vehicle here, and that three vehicles here full of gas. If I can do anything for you, people let me know. Had another gentleman that called in. I've got a chainsaw ready to go. Uh, people saying, if you need help of any way, you know, any kind, please let us know. And it was just great community involvement. 
and I'm sure that's for all the communities involved would have done the same thing. But just a little, a little blurb sometimes on Facebook can really get a lot of people going, good or bad. Because back here eight months ago or so, I made a little blurb on Facebook and. And within three hours, I had a call from my regional manager <laughs> at the time, you know? And uh, it was great. <laughs> Thank you. It works. Professor uh, Just a little update on the, uh, my beloved uh, Pomnico Point uh, uh, trail. Uh, with, with the easterly wind, uh, the eastern side got a, a beating with uh, phase one with all kinds of rocks and trees and stuff. But uh, anyway, we will you know, get the rocks out eventually and, and uh, fix things up. Uh, a few of the bridges were almost afloat. <laughs> but uh, anyway, and then uh, when the wind hauled to the western, well, on the western side, uh, some of the trees, uh, some of the older trees uh, fell over, uh, I guess. Uh, so, so that's another, uh, you know. But we will eventually, uh, once uh, the weather gets a little bit better, we will uh, surely uh, get together and, and fix that up. and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, it won't happen for a while, but uh, Mother Nature sometimes has a way of uh, controlling things, so uh, we, can't, uh, we can't control Mother Nature. You think? <laughs> Thank you. Next is the staff report, and I'll get our CAO to brief us on his reports, if he so wishes. Absolutely. Um, so, first of all, uh, I just want to say very quickly, one of our staff members uh, who is an avid uh, birder has been, uh, I guess, uh, recognized. I don't know if that's the proper term as, as the as having captured uh, via photo. Uh, the, he was the seventh, had the seventh most uh, uh, pictures of variety of birds uh, in Canada, Canada, not North America, Canada, um, which is it's a it's a. I'll help you out here. Thanks. It's, I'm, I'm it's a site, throw me a line here. It's, it's, it's a site called eBirds, and right. you and you uh, you submit your uh, sightings that you see any particular day or any part of that day. You submit these onto this site that is administered by Cornell University, I believe, in, in, in wherever that is in I believe. I'm not sure, but anyhow, he was seventh most in either Canada or North America in the number of. Uh, List that we listed last year, and that would be Alex Dantzmo. Oh, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Who is indirectly our our staff? He's with the District Planning Commission, but uh, he's just one of our many amazing yeah. uh, staff that that uh, has a very unique uh, talent and art, and he's just displaying it to to the world, obviously. So he's he's a pretty cool guy, and so I just want to say that out loud. Um, so I'm just going to focus my staff report on three areas that I guess that I'm focusing the most of my time. And one is uh, is uh, the building, the administration building, which actually there is an item on the uh, later on. So I'll probably not say much here. We'll just wait till we get to some of the pictures. I'll just say very briefly that it is moving along, and uh, the Wild Salt has uh, engaged, um, and they had to switch uh, mechanical engineers. Uh, on the project because they had they saw the complexity around the renewable energy aspect of the building, and they needed somebody with that particular expertise. Uh, it might end up costing a little bit more money, but what we're doing is we're applying for funds through Energy uh, uh, Nova Scotia Energy and the FCM. Um, one or both uh, will will be successful. Uh, they might both be, and, and whatever we don't, whatever isn't, it's, it is gas tax eligible. So it is it is worth uh, the additional money because of the, the benefits of having uh, low to no operating costs uh, moving forward. So it does it does put us in a good position to have as as I like to as I like uh, somebody else paying for the project. So <laughs> I like to have other people paying for it. So rather than having the uh, the direct municipal tax dollars. Uh, for that project so uh, right now they're looking at uh, solar and um, we are still doing tests around uh, geothermal which would be underground geothermal so that technology has changed quite a bit I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with it um, not very familiar with it I know how it works generally and um, they're very efficient as it is what the municipality of Yarmouth uh, installed in their building albeit would be a lot larger there than it would be uh, for us, it's, it's massive, right? They have a, they have a room full of 
equipment that that uh, is required. So, so that's moving ahead. Uh, that may have delayed them slightly, but they are moving ahead on design, which I will talk about later. We'll we'll display the pictures. They're online here on the agenda. We'll talk briefly about those uh, when I get to that point. Uh, the other piece is uh, where I've been spending quite a bit of time is on the airport, uh, taking on the interim manager position, as you know. And for those of you who uh, attended the meeting, the last meeting, um, what you saw was the board decide on what, what the airport is going to be moving forward. And we called it a top tier 301. And what that essentially means is, is that um, uh, we, we are not focusing on restoring uh, uh, the same uh, level uh, that it was there in the past, which would uh, allow us to do regular passenger service. As long as we stay as 301, that is regular, the restoration of passenger service to the Yarmouth International Airport will not occur. Um, it, it must be a 302 registered in order to be, in order to accept regular passenger service. Now, all of the, we haven't had regular passenger service there for quite some time. We've had a lot of traffic, however, and a lot of the traffic is charter. Chartered flights uh, represent about 15 to 18 percent of what comes in. Uh, or actually 24, 25 percent, uh, 15 to 18 is more safety and security related. Um, in my short uh, stint there and in my meetings uh, that I've had with staff there, they were uh, three medevac um, evacuations that occurred by fixed wing. Those are live saved. Three, and sorry, three when? Three medevacs in the last three weeks that oh, I've been Oh, since there. you've been there. Since oh. I've been there. There have been more, but there have been three while I was present. And so, um, you know, so, so it just, it, it, and so as a consequence, we, I mean, we obviously don't know when those services will occur, so the airport has to be ready. So that's why we're calling it a tier, a, a top tier 301. There's a couple of other reasons why we believe it to be uh, a bigger uh, than, than a Digby and bigger than Port Hawkesbury Airport, and it's the current lighting system. The current lighting system is set up for 302 for a for a regular passenger service. Um, however, uh, the board felt it was important to continue to have that service because of safety and security and, and the fact that those lights actually save lives. Um, pilots make a decision to land that is different because of those lights. They make a more, a, a more last minute decision. That sounds kind of awkward, but they make a, a more last minute decision to land, which does <coughs> save lives. So um, that is an important aspect of the airport. And the third and final reason why we feel it's that the board felt it was a top tier 301 <coughs> is that we have 24-7 operations in the tower. And that's something that other 301s don't have. We're fortunate to have it. And it's not something that we pay for. It's something that Nav Canada, uh, we have a contract with Nav Canada that, that allows us that opportunity to be in contact with, with pilots essentially 24-7 if, if it's needed. So it is, it is a bigger service. It is a much bigger service than Digby. It is, a much, what is, it is a slightly bigger service than Port Hawkesbury. However, it is not a 302 airport. And so as a consequence of being top tier 301, there are a number of things that we can do differently and save costs as a consequence. We've already done that. Uh, we've already, there is security that's no longer required at that location because of the regulations are now a lot less. Uh, we have an interim manager as opposed to a full-time manager, and uh, we had a policy writer that's no longer that's no longer employed at, at the airport. So at this point, it's staffed tight, and uh, until we can take a, another look at uh, what needs to happen, we are currently running one runway, not two. So obviously, the operating cost of running one is half of. And so, and so that is also going to have an impact, and not necessarily immediately, but in the in the long term. And so there are decisions around which uh, which runway ought to be used, and the board is very clear that it should be 0624, the longer one, which is currently closed. So we are using the shorter of the two uh, runways. It's harder to maintain uh, in the winter. However, um, you know it is still a safe. Uh, runway and 0624 is our priority runway and will be restored to a priority runway once we're able to to make uh, some changes to it and um, other small things is we're moving waste check to the Coast Guard building um, that's happening now um, they're going to be moving over so so the Coast Guard building will be almost full 
and our plan would be to mothball or like reduce the expenses of the former waste check building so that you know nobody's in there let's 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 winterize it let's keep the costs down to a minimum uh still a lot of work to do and uh it won't all be done by march 31st uh but we are moving ahead and i'm i have to say that the the staff has been very very supportive of, of the work being done so it yes i'm a little long-winded on the airport it has been quite a bit of my work over the past uh 30 days to try to get um try to get going on that and the last piece is the provincial AMA work that I'll be involved in later in the month, which is essentially, uh, you may have heard uh, me on the radio about municipal modernization. That's the AMA board's uh, position that, that it's time that the UNSM and the AMA and the province of Nova Scotia take a look at how municipalities operate. And we have to look at how, how they can operate differently and, and what is driving those decisions and what's driving the urgency of us thinking more regional uh, in how we deliver our services and that would be all I would have it's plenty uh, if there's any questions no, very good. Um, please uh, don't hesitate Councillor Surratt I just had probably four or five questions if I could go through them it's basically about the airport uh, before I go to the airport I just want to make it clear here on that we're being taped there were several people that came at the garage and they uh, stopped at the right, and they thought that you were done oh. here, and you were had moved on to mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. to the uh, to the airport, and you were not our CEO anymore. Right. So just to be clear, I said no. As far as I know, I said, but I, I said I don't think so. I'm still here. Yeah. Right. On. <laughs> and the other question was, are we paid? Are you paid for that? And people were wondering. I said I think it's municipality of Argyle is doing that in kind to help the airport get back on its feet. Uh, we will be asking the airport corporation uh, to to pay the municipality of Yarmouth uh, of Argyle. Sorry, <laughs> probably not Yarmouth. <laughs> Maybe later, not now. Yeah. To pay the municipality of Argyle a fee for my services, I there will be. I will not be compensated for those services. Right. The, the taxpayers of this municipality Which was a question. Was will that. be uh, will will receive a revenue from the airport for those services. So question that was there. If I could, another one would be. Uh, you stated that Yarmouth was bigger than, or uh, was a bigger airport than Port Hawkesbury, and the movements, because uh, Al McDonald told me the movements were way more than Yarmouth in Port Hawkesbury. So, what would make you say that? Oh, the movements are more in Port Hawkesbury. There's no doubt about it. Okay. But the size oh, I get of the operation in Yarmouth is larger, and okay. what they do in Yarmouth is all year long versus uh, Port Hawkesbury. So Port Hawkesbury, they've had the, the, the good fortune of having a lot of corporate jets come in to, to come and golf at the, golf. At the lakes yeah. uh, that is so popular worldwide. So that has made a tremendous difference to their operations. Um, they have as many, if not more, um, uh, flights that come in on an annual basis, but it's it's clustered in the season and for, for the most part uh, the winter season is is much less they don't have a full-time operation they don't have the full-time weather operations that we do um, we did have Al McDonald and, and Derek Denny uh, come to the airport and they were surprised as to how much there was here and uh, and you know they they shared uh, you know they shared the statement that you've got you've got a very large airport that's larger than the population would sustain um, you know, it was built for a particular purpose back in the Second World War. So, so you know, they recognized how m much infrastructure that we're dealing with there, and so they could see, they agreed that there are challenges with that size because the movements aren't matching Duh. that size. Yeah. Final question is, uh, on your snow removal, I know I might be probing into some of the stuff you're looking at, I was telling us that, and now I know why, that the snow removal in Port Hawkesbury was contracted out. Correct. But here it's a different operation. I guess what we're opening in the winter and, and that, I don't know if that causes a, but have you looked at maybe contracting, maybe storing, contracting out, the snow, instead of having staff there, contracting out, or that could be a possible look maybe? It's, it's one of the objectives that we have uh, to, to look into. I think, you know, our winter planning is, is, is come and gone. Like that's be something that we would look at um, after this winter is completed, uh, we have to understand exactly what equipment we need. 
and what needs to be replaced. And then we have to do a make versus buy analysis. We have to say, well, are we going to buy it or are we going to have somebody else uh, provide that service? The same is true with summer operations um, around uh, asphalt uh, restoration. Uh, there are ways that we can do things differently and perhaps utilize internal uh, resources to do it more efficiently. So we'll also be examining that. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great, Thank you. great report. Thank you for your. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Surratt. Uh, Councilor, uh, Deputy Warden Muse. Uh, I'm just wondering in the, with a 302, the snow removal, they had to keep it clean all the time, right? Like you, as soon as there was X number of inches of snow on the, on the runway, they had to clean it. Is that the same thing with 301? Are we operating now as a 301 or a three, still a 302? Uh, there are aspects of our operations that still mimic a 302. Okay. Um, they're, they're the, we are not obligated. So what happens with the Transport Canada regulations, they, they have suggested regulations in 301, whereas it's obligatory regulations in 302. Yeah. So, so I, I, can't, I can't say for certain whether their winter operations now mimics a 301 more than a 302. I do know that they, they take uh, cleaning that runway very seriously because of the medevac. Oh. And oh, so exactly. I went by a couple of times and every time I went by, they were there cleaning the runway. Oh yeah, and, yeah. and, and they have been working on that one runway quite diligently yes. for the past, well, as long as it's been snowing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, the difference weeks. this year and last year was two versus one. Um, it, it becomes a bit more manageable mm -hmm. from a staff perspective to do just yeah. the one. And I'm, I, the board hasn't really landed, no pun intended, on this, but they've said really they really would focus on one runway. Mm -hmm. They haven't actually said we want one runway and one runway only. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, the first step was do, do you, are you really going to go for 302 again? And, and that's just too costly at this time. So yeah, I won't, there are pieces of operation that probably look like 302 still. Right. We're still transitioning for sure. Okay. Anybody else? One more quick question if yes, I could. Councilor the, uh, the, 30, the, the runway you're using now, I saw in your report that uh, it costs $4,000 roughly just for the de-icing de on some part because the, uh, the water, the slush stays there and freezes and it's very expensive because it's gonna be thawed out. Have you had to spend a lot of money there because of the weather we've had? Uh, I'm not aware that they that they used the uh, de-icing uh, substance, yeah. the glycol. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know that they manage it as much as they can. Yeah. Um, I haven't been made aware that they've needed to use it. Uh, in fact, I watched a medevac uh, land in yeah. was a pretty nasty you know, weather situation and, and uh, I don't believe that they needed to do that and it landed safely and it's expensive stuff, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it is but it's it gonna is. be safe, but it's gonna be safe. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. That's great. Yeah. So uh, really and just just to clarify, you know, there might be a lot of questions like why is the CEO of the municipality of Argyle doing this? Right? Why what is he up to? What's what's up his sleeve? Uh, really it's it's about uh, doing what, what Council has been talking about for, for for a long time, which is, you know, if we're going to be part of of this investment, we have to make sure that this investment is 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 sustainable and and that we can manage the size. So I've I've inserted myself um, for good or for bad. I've inserted myself to to uh, to see if we can you know take a um, a financial approach to this and 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 operate it differently. So it is to benefit uh, all parties, including including the municipality of Argyle, because we know you have other priorities and you don't want that number to go up, you want it to go down, so you do other things. And we still want to save lives, the airport's still important. So so that's that's really the, the logic behind why why I've uh, personally inserted myself in that situation. And, and uh, I've had quite a few years experience with it, which is why I put my hand up. And uh, hopefully we'll see some success and uh, I think when you say we want to save lives, by all means we do. But we want to save it also for all of southwestern Nova Scotia. You know, like there's, it doesn't only stop, you know, or start at the Argyle line and stop at the Yarmouth Municipality line. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more people being transferred out from other areas. It's true. And, and people are, are perhaps not aware of that. 
That's right. And, and that's one of our of one of our challenges is to is to get that information out there for residents and for for for, for political uh, for for councils and for for taxpayers and for provincial governments. And that's right. It's to remind people what's going on. Exactly. Well, I appreciate Great. what you say. Well, thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Very informative for everybody. We'll move on now. There was no more questions. Okay. We'll move on now for number 10, other business. And There's something else here. You picked up something. Oh, number 10 now. Yeah, yeah. No. That's where we were. Sorry. <laughs> we're getting old, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> number 10A. You was going to 10B. 10A is uh, emergency health services. We uh, we asked for some information a, a while back. I believe it was November-ish, maybe October. Uh, we sent in and asked for some information on on department standards for response time. It was the main one, and we got our we got some answers back. I'm assuming. A lot of people aren't happy with the answers. So where we go from here, I don't know, but I'll open it up to uh, councillors for their comments and perhaps suggestions on what we do. And I'm pretty sure who might like to speak first, but I'll look around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess and I'll so take- big thing, you like to speak? I guess I'll take a crack at it. Um, first of all, I'm no longer a paramedic in the province of Nova Scotia. I resigned a couple of months ago. And that was my, my own choice. I worked uh, for the company that manages the ambulance service in Nova Scotia for uh, approximately 13 years. I will say they were a very good company to work for. They were good to me. Uh, no problems there. I just feel as though uh, by looking at these times, when they made Pubnico base a non-priority base, uh, it did not set, with, set well with me by no means. I was asked uh, on Facebook uh, back in, I believe, the end of uh, March, I believe, of 2017, if it was true that Pubnico uh, Ambulance was uh, declassified down or lowered down to a non-priority ambulance, which I responded on Facebook that that's what had happened. Uh, and responded as a counselor at the time because I'd heard through some information I had received. Um, when uh, that happened, that was around four o'clock in the afternoon. And around 7.30 that evening, I had a call from my regional manager at the time. Um, it wasn't, he wasn't calling to tell me I had, uh, you know, received the employee of the month award or nothing like that <laughs> that evening. Uh, he was calling to uh, say he had heard that I'd made a statement on Facebook and uh, that I did not agree with that decision that was made for the Pubnicos of the Argyles. And I told him, yes, I did make that statement on Facebook and I made it as a counselor. Uh, he advised me at that time that he thought I should take it down. And I said, no, I said, that's not going to happen. And then he went on to say, well, I guess, you know, there could be uh, some repercussion and uh, we may have to look at, uh, you know, a talk with you and stuff like that. And uh, maybe some disciplinary action. So he said, are you going to take it down? And I said, no, I can't see it coming down. I put it there. I put it there uh, for the safety, I guess, of the Pubnicos and the Argyles. Uh, something that they had there for 50 years was an ambulance service serving those er that area. It was something that was promised to them when the company took over in 2004 that they would never lose, that it would remain a priority base. And uh, then, uh, so anyway, the next day, I guess I found out that I was on administrative leave for a couple of days. And uh, 
So that was all right. There's no problem. Um, so anyway, the summer went on. I, I was supposed to have a talk with them, I guess, before I went back to work. I never did go back to work as a paramedic. Um, I, uh, I felt as though I couldn't go back to work as a paramedic. Uh, knowing that I might be stationed some night in Yarmouth or Barrington and something bad happened and knowing I should have been at the base that we were promised uh, back in 2004. We were not only promised by uh, the management company and if, you read, if anyone's wondering why I'm not saying any names here this evening, I was also told that I signed a disclosure at the time now, I've been looking for this disclosure that I've signed, or may have signed, or may not have signed. This was 13 years ago. I don't know what I signed 13 years ago. And um, so anyway, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, slandering the company by no means as far as the company. Uh, I do not think this decision is a safe decision. Uh, back uh, just in the last two weeks, and that uh, there's been two calls one over towards East Pubnico and one towards one in Lower West Pubnico that uh, the ambulance one of them on one call it took the ambulance over 20 minutes to respond respond and the other call down in Lower West Pubnico it took the ambulance over 30 minutes to respond and the reason I know that for a fact is when the people called 911 after they got off the phone and that they called my phone and asked me if I'd go down with them and wait for the ambulance to get there. It was two calls of serious nature and uh, it was quite a thing for these people to have to wait for that ambulance to come 20 and 30 minutes down the road and knowing that the ambulance should have been within six or eight minutes of, uh, of their location. Um, the, like I say, it's nothing personal with the company. I just feel as though this is not what we were promised. I can see by the times that we received from EHS, some other, some other times have in, increased in other areas, but I feel as though they increased and we've lost in that. And I don't think uh, we hear that healthcare is getting better all the time in Nova Scotia. I don't think uh, one person's gain should be another person's loss and that and I am still going to make it very vocal and that that we need the ambulance restored to a priority base in Pubnico I'm not doing it nothing against the company but I'm doing it for the people of the Pubnicos and the Aragiles this lady this evening here put on a very good and that um, information session on AEDs and how minutes count, minutes do count. It's as simple as that. And um, I just, I'm not gonna back down. And um, I was told I was beating a dead horse and that, but I'll guarantee you by the time I'm done beating, I'll make sure he's dead. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any suggestions for action on, on what we have here in front of us? So, um, I don't know where to go from here. I believe um, my next, um, well, there's been this counselor Bork, I'll let her go now. Um, I think our next step is a petition and a petition in the municipality of Argyle, and, or we can go further than that as well, because we got to show that this end of the province is not going to take take this sort of uh, treatment so um, I, I totally agree with, I'm totally backing up Glenn Councillor Digden and um, I'm gonna stand right right next to him all the way so I'm gonna fight with him and I think the next step is that we put out a petition and that we show the government that we're not gonna stand for this make that a motion I make that a motion second you want to discuss the motion, Councillor Sarek? Yes, uh, Glenn, uh, I may as well get the question to Glenn. I read on the report here, and I know that's what they're going to come back to us on. They're saying here it's, you know, we used to be this minute, so we're within the, uh, 
the, the, the calls that uh, how much time they should be spending uh, at calls. In, in fact, we're within reason. So, what do you think happened? Have they fudged? I may as well call it a spade a spade. It seems that from what you're telling me, it seems like they fudged the numbers here. Or, or, or what have they done? Because Probably if average. I've got a report here, then you're telling me that, and you know, and, I, and by the way, I agree with what you're saying, but what have they done here? How can we go? They're going to push that back in our face. I don't know what they've done here, and that I honestly don't know. I can't comment on those numbers. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, what we should push back to them is why do we have to lose for someone else to gain? Why do, and it's not only a Pubnico Argyle, it's the municipality. We have one ambulance, and that served in this municipality that was a priority base. And it's, we've lost the priority status. And when I look around this table here this evening, every area, and, that, and I'm, I know this for a fact, every area of each councillor's districts, the ambulance from Pubnico has responded at some point in time to calls in their areas. So what I'm looking at, if that ambulance is not in Pubnico tonight, if the ambulance is in Bering this, in this evening, or in Metagan this evening, each one of our constituents is gonna wait that much longer for that ambulance to get on location. And I don't think we should take it easy. I don't think we should take it lightly. And that. You know what, when we were here, and this is why when we got the report, I was so, so, so baffled because I heard from firemen, M M MFR, I think they're called, some of the, some of the firefighters, they, they're, they've been trained, some people, and they, gave us numbers of how long it was taking since it had been from the priority base to just a, whatever they did and stuff like that. And certainly when I saw it, I couldn't believe it. We had people that responded right here in front of them. You knew what, what it was. And now to, to come and see this, it's totally shocked. And I back you up 100% on that. We got to do it like Kathy said, a petition or something. We got to push back. Not a question. Thank you. And I'm just looking at this lady over here, some of the numbers she gave us. Uh, seven to ten percent for every minute a normal heartbeat is restored. So you take our response times according to EMC or EMC's response times, and I'm saying EMC because that's where the letter came from, and that the response time has increased by 2.5 percent in the Pubnicos. So which means that that we've just taken 25 percent chance away, and that from that person possibly getting a life-saving technique for applied to them. And that just by those numbers there that that lady's given us, just on 2.5 minutes. So. Thank you, Glenn. CEO, um, news, comment? Uh, well, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe we asked the wrong questions as staff. You know, uh, one of the things I know that we asked for was average response times and, for, and we focused on the Pubnico area. The problem with average is just that, right? Uh, that could be two minutes or 18 minutes, but the average is 10. Um, so, you know, one of the things that had, that occurred to me when we received this letter is that, first of all, we never received the raw data. We just received a summary in the letter, which I, I you know, being a bit of a statistics nerd guy, that I, I would probably <laughs> like to see the actual information. And so the actual information, you might, you might come to different conclusions around what that actually means. Like if somebody is saying it took 30 minutes and the average is 10, if that is in fact true, then it means there's a lot of them that were really, really fast. But there's, you know, probably some that were really slow too. And the other, you know, to your point, Councillor, is, is that we don't, we didn't ask for the municipality. And so your point is, is that every community is likely impacted. And so it would be interesting to get that information for the rest of the municipality and see what impact did it did occur if somebody at a Quinnan made a, you know, had an EHS call or et cetera, named the community, right, Morris Island. So, so um, you know, one of the other things that we can certainly do is, is push back to EHS and say, let's, let's get the raw data, let's get actual data, and let's get the data for, for the entire um, for the entire region and, and state very clearly in, in a transparent way that we'll be sharing this with the minister. Because 
you know, who really, you know, they're accountable to the minister. We're, they're not accountable necessarily directly to us. So um, those are the only additional points that I would add to to your uh, observations. And uh, and uh, I don't know if it's something that you wish to do as a council to push back and get additional information from. Uh, the only thing there, what I'm looking at, uh, Yarmouth and District times have got better. And what Yarmouth and District, uh, their numbers have increased, have got better, but again, the publicos and that have decreased and that have or increased, the times have increased. And that so some of like, uh, you may see that the ambulance. Uh, is responding a little bit quicker in the public in the Tusket area now, sorry, or in Quinnan or in uh, Amiro's Hill. But at the same time, like I say, and that they are because that ambulance that should have been stationed in Pubnico that evening may be in Yarmouth that evening, working in Yarmouth. It, the big thing is, folks, and I guess I might as well say it because it's as simple as, as it is, and that there's the workload is getting higher up there. The volume is getting larger. The call volume is getting larger. And uh, we have an aging population. So it is going to, going to increase the call volume. And that they're trying to do it, I believe, with not enough ambulances on the road. And they're not taking into account and that for the call volumes and that so what they're trying to do as far as I'm concerned they're trying to take out of their smaller areas make sure their places that have more of a population are covered and that hoping that when that call comes in because there's more of a population that the call will come in there and that may be the case sometimes but for the person that has that heart attack in Pubnico or the Argyles and that that's it's no good then and that and when there is ambulances, uh, this is I heard now, uh, there's ambulances at some bases and that, that the Pubnico ambulance or the people working in Pubnico will back into at night to cover, let's say, Barrington or Metagan and leave Pubnico open. And there's an ambulance sitting there, nobody in it, no staff. And that these ambulances is out of service, and that. So I don't think, you know, I just don't think the people of Pubnicos and the Argyles, and that should be left hanging to go cover down the road 20 minutes or half an hour, hoping that the bad call is not going to come in in Pubnico. Councilor Ball. I mean, we can sit here and, and probably argue with them for the next three years about statistics and call volumes and whatnot. What gets me, what aggravates me about this whole thing was uh, the history lesson we got on this base uh, a few meetings back. The, uh, the ambulance was, was uh, divested to uh, EHS or whatnot, or, or uh, I forget which is the parent entity or whatnot, but under the impression that the community who, who fundraised uh, who, who eventually got this ambulance that they wanted in this community was sort of reluctantly but given to them under the assumption that it would always be a priority base and that they promised it would always be a priority base and now it's not. And I don't care very much for people who go back on their promises. And that's what gets me more than the statistics. I mean, even if the numbers didn't make sense, if, if that was taken over and given back from a hardworking community who, who did fundraising and worked together to get that ambulance there, under a promise, and that promise was just broken. That's that's enough to, to get me going, and I think we should do what we need to to, to you know to get him to own up to that at least and, and change it back. Thank you very much. Anybody else? So have we settled on some sort of course of action? Other like we're going to do a petition, but is, we have a motion, motion on the floor. Motion on the floor. Yeah, yeah. that was quite a while ago. <laughs> yeah. Anyone? Any question? You're in the question. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. 10B. I, I think. I think we should still deal with the recommendation here. 
you know, there's, there's a recommendation here that, that we get a letter to get to, to, to address the concerns and, and maybe get the raw data, right? I mean, the petition is fine, but I'm wondering if we shouldn't try to get better information than what we have here, which was a recommendation on... I don't know. Right? I don't know if we should look for any more information coming from Halifax. Uh, we had a medical doctor in here that night that said he doesn't always back up what comes down from Halifax. He said, he stated, a medical doctor with many years experience, many years working the ER, that at some point in time, this is not going to be a good outcome for someone in the public or the Argyles. We had an ER nurse here tell them the same thing, and yet they don't seem to listen. So as far as I'm concerned, what they're going to send us down is just going to be what they want us to hear. And that's the same thing like they said, you know, oh, we look at call volumes and we, we make changes as need be. Well, I don't know why it took them 13 years to make a change in Pubnico mm -hmm. because it was, this is the first time that that ambulance has ever been dropped down to a non-priority ambulance. No. So. And, and I certainly wasn't suggesting that if we get the information that we say, okay, that's fine. I'm saying that we feel that the information here is is an average and, and let's see the actual because there are calls out there that were 30 minutes. We know that. I, 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 was, at, I was at one function that, that it took 30 minutes in Pabnico, right? And uh, looking at these figures, you would never tell you, you, you wouldn't be able to tell that, no, there have been some, some incidents there that were 30 minutes. And at least if we had that information that, yes, there are calls that are taken that, that, that you know, it might, it might uh, uh, strengthen our case as well. I don't know. It, it, it wasn't to say that I'm looking for information to, to decide, no, we, we, we should leave things the way they are. That's not what, that's not my, my uh, th that's not what my, my uh, uh, question was. It's the question that, we should get the actual, if we can get that, whether they can or they can't, I don't know. Yeah. Actual times for call for a call Calls. that happened? Well, I was talking uh, to our MLA this week about this. So what happens there is uh, the person that requested the ambulance that evening or that day has to fill out a form or the patient has to fill out a form and uh, along with their um, their health card number on it and make a request again to EHS and that or EMC how much how long it did take for that ambulance oh, to they come can't on get scene. that out oh that's private that's that's confidentiality even, even without giving names or giving oh, anything like I say that's confidentiality okay. or a way of saying we're not going to give you that number did you ever have a letter is there a letter anywhere like this you know uh, as Rebel was saying, is there a letter somewhere that says it was agreed in a letter and somebody's got that letter? Uh, you know Sorry. what? I honestly don't know if that letter is out there. And I guess a reason there uh, is sometimes bigger businesses work different than the, what we do, say or do in this area of the province or down this way. If I make a promise to you, and that as far as I'm concerned, if I make a promise to you and shake your hand or whatever, or tell you I'm gonna do it for you, that's as good as any letter that you can spend your ink on. And that, but some people wanna see this letter. Yeah. So. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Are we ready to move on? Okay. New administration building internal design update. And I believe we're gonna have a little uh, slideshow presentation. No, we're not. Well, the, the slideshow will be uh, on um, what uh, Scott has arranged is that the residents will see the pictures in the slideshow. The pictures that I'll be talking about are on your agenda. Yep. And it's, uh, it's just a, a, a depiction of what the uh, architects are looking at at this time. It's not, it, it may not look exactly like this, uh, but it will look very similarly to, to this. So uh, the order of the pictures, um, and I'll go very, you know, I'll, I'll try not to go into too much detail in each picture. So the first picture in your attachment is the, is the main, is the main um, reception area. So as people will walk in, 
this is approximately what they will see. Um, there have been changes to this where you see it's municipalité d'Argal municipality. The words municipalité and, mun and municipality will be deleted. It will just say Argyle, and it will be in a different font, and it will be lit, and probably it'll look a little different. So it, you know, so it'll be a little less wordy. Um, also, uh, in the back, what you see there, which looks like little boxes from far away, is um, it's it's their depiction or their uh, rendition of old and new lobster pots. And so they kind of designed it in, in a way that you could also use it for storage. So you can see that there's certain areas where there's nothing. There looks like little, um, you know, statues or whatever. So some of them will be open uh, to to pictures or or art or something, and the rest will will look, you know, kind of rustic, either old or the new cage design, uh, lobster uh, trap. So it kind of speaks very very closely to our our history. And as you see, there, there, all of the services that we that would require front desk services will be in one place. So as people walk in the front, they'll see uh, recreation, uh, taxation, and and uh, and what we're calling reception, uh, which will will be you know for your for your public works. That will be where Kim, our public works uh, assistant, will be. So it'll be Kim, Bonnie, and and in recreation could be one of the directors of recreation, active living. Or in the summertime, we have the summer students that will be located there. So there will be some crossover, so they'll be able to help each other when, when things, when when you know when if it's if it gets busy, they'll, they'll be able to help each other, and it'll 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 allow for a, a better cohesiveness amongst departments. Um, residents care less about the departments; they care more about the service. So that's the concept. So the second picture is is if you were sitting at the reception desk, if you were uh, Kim sitting at reception and you looked left, that's what you would see. So there will, will be a little uh, coffee station for, so this coffee station would be for council because the, the great hall or the, the big council chambers is not far from this location. So uh, as you know, the kitchen is on the polar end, the other end. So there'll be a small station here for coffee and drinks, etc. Um, to the left, you'll see an interview room. It's a very small room, and there's pictures of, of that that will be coming in the future. And if you see uh, out further uh, in the picture, you'll see a dark stain along with what looks like trees that are white. It looks like a painted white. That is where the boardroom will be located. Okay. So. Um, Hola. Yes. Would would that uh, I know it, maybe the picture. But if it was an interview room, like for if a counselor or whoever wants to interview someone, would you have a, 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 a clear, clear pane door there? Yeah, here would be yes for secu for 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 security purposes. We would rather people see that there's somebody there. However, the the conversation would be private. Maybe if a curtain you could slide, maybe you absolutely that would be an option. The other the other option is if if a counselor really wanted to have an interview. Uh, with somebody, they may cho not choose to have it there. Oh, yeah. There will be other places that will be more uh, quiet or, or private. For instance, we'll see the boardroom uh, in the next picture. We'll be showing the boardroom, and the boardroom might be a place that's a bit more private. Okay. So the third picture is a is a closer view of that. If you see that there's a door on the right hand side that looks dark, that door goes to the extra space. So where, if you recall, there's extra government offices. We call them extra government offices. That might be that might be you know potential expansion for us if we needed it, or it could be uh, for other government related services. So the next picture is the is the top view of the boardroom. The concept that they have in the, the boardroom is not particularly large. It it uh, it will seat eight comf or nine comfortably. Um, the, the great hall or the council chambers will have a greater seating capacity <coughs> and uh, this boardroom is uh, the intent would be that the furniture would be handmade so we're looking at local options to construct the boardroom table uh, a lot of the boardroom tables that you buy are extremely expensive and they're all you know wired for sound <coughs> so what we're looking at is is something a bit more basic but with the ability to to connect easily your computers 
So what we're looking at is a boardroom table that would have an opening, that would have a physical opening in the boardroom table in the middle so that you could plug your devices in below the boardroom table. So um, actually one of our staff members is going to, is, is willing and able to gift the wood that would be used for that. So it's pretty cool. Uh, the next um, picture is, is if, you were, if you were sitting at the reception desk and looking straight, this is what you would see. So this would be the hallway running to, towards what we're, what we're calling the Great Hall. We don't really have a great name for it yet. We're hesitating to call it council chambers because it's multi-use. So, but it is where council would meet. Um, so this is the hallway running to that meeting room. Obviously the washrooms are to the left um, and the washrooms, uh, so here you would be able to sit in the hallway comfortably. Uh, there would be stools and chairs there for residents and councillors alike. And the next uh, slide would be, you know, there will be some, obviously that's not local art, what you see there, but the, the intent it would be to have local art hung on the, uh, on the, the wall. And while the colors of the washroom doors may not be, you know, hot pink, they, they will be different colors so as to bring out some color or flavor to, to, to that. Um, and it breaks up the, it breaks up the, the hallway. Uh, the next picture is, is a bunch of coat hangers. It doesn't look particularly interesting, but this would be the main, this would be where staff would enter. So this is the mud room. So public works, if they have to like change their gear and, and you know, uh, this would be where, where everybody can actually just take their winter clothes and, you know, switch off into whatever. So that, so you're not dragging that stuff through the entire facility. And if you see it is connected to the kitchen and the next, uh, um, what's not pictured here is that there is a washroom and a shower in that same location. So that's, primarily for active living purposes, but, well, I shouldn't say primarily, secondly for active living, primarily for public works, if they're into waste wa uh, wastewater and, you know, that can get messy. So we do have a, an area for, for our, our staff to get clean. And so the next slide is approximately what the kitchen will look like from that angle. There'll be a, a larger table, um, a seating table uh, here. And so it's just, you know, uh, the, the, the appliances may not necessarily look what you're seeing here. It's conceptual, but, but there would, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming most of that will be there. There'll be a microwave, there'll be a fridge. And those two doors to the left and right are lockable. So those, like if we had a, a, an event that the community could use that they would not have, that they wanted use of the kitchen, they could do so without having access to the entire building. So the next, uh, the next option or the next um, picture is the four options that they were looking at for the offices. As you know, the offices that we would work in day to day are very small. They're not huge. They're eight by 10, I believe. And what there are four options. The option four is the one that we felt was the best, which is a glazed sliding door with a window above desk height. So that there was some privacy around, you know, people sitting and so, so people don't see, you know, a bunch of legs seated you know there is some privacy around if people want to you know have a little privacy uh, on whatever the case may be but there is still a very open obviously an open uh, view uh, of, of the exterior and so if the next uh, the next picture is just another another angle showing the same thing and the next picture same thing different angle and one more time. So, uh, and as, as we said before, the offices with maybe one exception will, will be essentially the same size. Any storage is gonna be elsewhere. So this is where we're at right now. I know that you've received this in advance, but we figured that this was an opportunity if we did a slideshow for the residents that they could see, you know, what we're looking at and, you know, what our likes and dislikes are. These are, are not 100%, uh, you know, ironed in stone. But the concept is, you know, obviously it's going to look a lot like this. So if you have any concerns or comments, certainly we welcome them from residents and council. And, uh, and we hope that uh, the comments that we've received thus far is that it feels like an inviting environment. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for an inviting environment. 
so that is the end of that. If there are any questions or comments or concerns. Deputy Warden, views? So <clears throat> we we are we were looking at, at possibly having this uh, tendered out by the end of February into March. First sure. into March. Yeah. Is that still a possibility? It's still a possibility. Although is we it a are, probability? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like anything else, um, I can't iron that down for sure for you now. Um, I'd I'd like to ask that question specifically of the architects um, to see um, what they envision. I mean, I know they've been working with all of the architect, all of the engineers along all the way along. Okay. So it's not impossible, but my my uh, impression is that we might be delayed. Yeah. Not significantly, right. but slightly. Yes, I mean, it, it's just that that's something that we had been discussing, that, that the timing of, of tendering out can make a difference in what the cost is going to be, depending right. on, on if, you know, how busy the contractors right. are and whatever. So, so if, we, if we end up too late in the summer, then I think we're going to see that uh, contractors are not hungry for, for work at that time, which means that they actually pay a little more. Um, they're working on the on the inside. Uh, the outside is pretty much what we've seen. That's that's pretty much what we're we're looking at. There, there's not going to be any changes that we know of on the outside. And these are questions that have been asked yep. to me by the public because there are still people concerned about those rules. No yeah. matter how we, oh yeah, we try to, to convince people or whatever, there are still people out there that are concerned more for the problem it's going to give us as a building built with those types of roofs and the cost of it. Are we going to be able to build that for that? For, for you know, that's questions that are coming to me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, are we going to be able? Are we going to see our taxes go up because they say there's no way you're going to build that for, for your budget? People well, don't know. The, the, I, the any tax increases will have absolutely zero. To do and this, this is project. what I tell people: it, it, it's not uh, the the roof itself. The roof structure itself represents between ten and twelve percent of the entire yes. project cost. Yes. So um, I would, I am, I am personally more worried about the mechanical and electrical components of, of the of the building, right. which represent probably between twenty and thirty percent of the cost of the building. That's the piece that concerns me the most. That's the piece where we have to make sure we get it right uh, the first time. Uh, the advantage is that that's absolutely an area that we can use gas tax if we're well, if we're it. going the, with the renewable energy route. Uh, look, we can't. Um, Nobody's going to sit here and say that that roof uh, won't accumulate a little bit of snow, uh, depending on the weather. Mm -hmm. um, it will. Um, that certainly that issue has been raised on more than one occasion with our architects, and they they have come back with us and said, "Look, we hear you. Uh, we acknowledge what you're saying. We're confident in the design. We will go back to our engineers and we'll make sure that they're aware." And so I think you know. I, with any roof, you're, you you have the potential of, course. of having an issue, and I think obviously the design of this one makes people a bit more nervous about it, and I can understand that 100%. Um, but I don't think that the construction of the roof will be a significant cost driver for the project, as much as other elements that have me a little bit more nervous than than the roof might might have me nervous. But it's about. just like I said, that's, that's questions are coming and uh, there are great questions and, 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 and we concerns, and you know? we share those concerns and yes. we've and we've raised them uh, uh, in more than one occasion. What you see in the newsletter is approximately what it will look like on the exterior. Uh, there were changes from the original presentation. Uh, the, the, uh, the the council section or the great hall section is has a different design. It has more more variety and has a, a gray, um, a, a grayish uh, front as opposed to it being all black, um, and I think that was an improvement. And uh, there's some other uh, just minor changes. Right now, we're still working on landscaping and and uh, which we're trying to do efficiently, clearly because this paving and and uh, and mechanical is really where they're focused. Right now. So I, you know, the, those 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 have been. 
you know, I, I would encourage residents to continue to raise those those issues, and and if there's anything else we can get them to to alleviate their concerns, uh, we'd be happy to share that for sure. And you get a lot of those questions from people who did not attend any of the meetings, too. You know, sure. so that's. It's a it's it's a big project and and, and people are legitimately nervous about what course, that might mean because so many times these projects go over budget and there's no saying that this one may may have you know may, may hit budget issues. I mean no no project is immune from that and so you know I, the only thing we can say is is we're we're very much committed to stay as close to our budget as as we can be right. and if we have to make changes to the design then so be it. Uh, we'll we'll do that. You know the architects have been, been very good with us, and and they they recognize the same that that this this is a very price sensitive project. Mm -hmm. So um, while they have done things that are really kind of extravagant, uh, they've also done things that are not uh, in order to to save and offset. So for instance, the flooring choices that they're going to have is going to be quite basic. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's there's other things that. That they are trying to manage within their own budget as well. They have they have the same obligation as we do. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions on the interior design? Seeing none. We'll move on to correspondence and for information. The first one I noticed uh, we didn't get the letter and come to deal with it in December, but it's the town of Yarmouth and the program they have going to meal a day for a hundred days I think there's a there's a financial component to that that perhaps we should deal with or do you see that um, so the request is a five hundred dollar donation per meal I think it's asking like, any, for any help that we might want to give. Do we want to uh, deal with this tonight or do we want to have more time to get more information? Or, uh, so where would the money go to? Because different organizations so are, 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 are too, yeah. different organizations are sponsoring each individual but is, meal. Is there any administrative uh, That's what I don't help know. from the town? Like, that I don't know for sure. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on the logistics. What I can say is, is if you're interested, you can make a motion to say that you are in fact interested in participating, and then the, and then we'll iron out the details. It's just you know, really from from our perspective, uh, it's the only it's that only the only thing that we need from from council is whether or not you're interested in. I I, I I personally think it's a great idea. I mean, they, you know, it serves and it and it serves. It, you don't have to be in need in order to attend. Anybody can attend as well, you know, and, and I think it was a great program to have because it does, it does certainly uh, 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 give the opportunity to people in need as well, I mean, for sure. Councillor Surratt. Uh, probably a question I've got is, uh, do they support us in anything we do in, in if we, for meals in this is for, it's a town project. And uh, when we do the experience Argyle, we, we do the whole thing and we spend our own money. I, I think this is a Yarmouth initiative. And I, I'm glad for them. I think it's a great idea what they're doing. I mean, it's on their, it's on their dime. I, you know, municipality of Yarmouth does something. <coughs> should be on theirs. Uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, great program, but you know, we, we do st stuff and we don't go, I don't think we should be bumming for doing for uh, fundraising for emergency fund. We don't go ask them for money to put all in tanks and stuff like that. I think that's a, your own municipal place that you do stuff like that and uh, in our own area. And uh, again, all the part of them, I think it's a great thing they're doing, but I, I believe it's in their jurisdiction and not ours. That's my opinion. Discussion yeah, and I, I was trying to figure out the same thing. So to everyone in the community, well, exactly. what's the community? Where's the community? Do we know or it, what? I, the, what I can answer to that is is that this is is the letter that's not uh, this letter is not addressed to us specifically. Okay. So it's a, if you if you notice the letter, oh, yeah. this letter has been sent. Um, 
to many organizations, okay. not necessarily directly to the municipality of Arba. Right. So um, we can get more information. It, certainly, it goes till March. You have time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if you believe that this is a good initially initiative, rather than getting on an all hands on deck uh, uh, style, you would do your own in your own community in the interest of supporting the idea that the town is initiating um, for its residents. So we can certainly, there's no rush to make a decision on this one. We can get information, get back to you, uh, no, no problem. And you may want to do it on your own, you know, and, and, and thank the town for their great idea. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great idea. I think we should stick to our own. But then, you know, that's my so are we, all, are we good with it for now until we... Yeah. Get more info. Okay. And the other two items are just public information. We move on to um, number 11, community grants. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc? Yeah, we have a community request uh, from Leo Bordreau, who's uh, uh, with uh, Paroes in Westport, and she's asking for five hundred dollars. I'll make a motion that we accept. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. I'll need some help on the next so one. So move. Second. <laughs> what is it about? <laughs> Oh, you've got your help. What is Glenn the trip? <laughs> <laughs> Glenwood Argyle Community Hall is asking for a community grant. Yep. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Did Again? someone second it? Yes. Aye. Aye. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. The motion carried. Uh, Moving on to agenda topics for the next meeting or notice of motions by councillors. Any. <clears throat> Anything on the top of somebody's head right now? Okay. Question period. Any questions from the public? Mm -hmm. Just a comment first on the building design. I think participating in the consultation that would be a way, but it um, looks like a great uh, design. Just want to know where the AE is going to be put. <laughs> Where should it be put? Nice, very nice. And the second thing is twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen. Eighteen. We should consider uh, gender neutral water. Uh, they are gender they are gender neutral. Totally okay. Yeah, yeah they, they just oh. indicate they're all they're every washroom is a uh, is a single okay. single washroom. So well, it was just the color of the door. It was no indication of gender whatsoever. <laughs> no, it was it was actually hot pink. Uh, so we're gonna change. we won't go with that color. Thought it was red. It's a great it's a great Any more questions? Okay, at this time I see we have an in camera session for a personnel matter. Slow move to go in camera. Thank you.